This is a study guide for the livestock midterm exam. You can prepare for the exam by using our ASU Learn study site and also materials that we've covered. The first topic that we covered at the beginning of the semester was farm safety due to the importance. And you needed to check off here and confirm for me that you have read over our farm safety, our protocols, general biosecurity, and then we also have infectious disease health protocols for COVID-19 when we travel, and you had to be sure to read these for each field trip that you were taking. We also have our SD farm case study for livestock. Although we don't have animals at the farm, right now this is a case study of what we intend to do what we've done in the past and then i also had some useful resources here in the case study for you about what our how our squeeze chute operates uh, this is something that i think everyone needs to know about how animals can be handled uh, humanely and securely uh, using a sweep chute uh, using our scale, uh, we have a platform scale and we attach our indicator whenever we're weighing animals, otherwise we keep the indicator inside. So these are some materials that give you an idea of how our facilities work and also the plan that we're making for our swine facilities. So this is our case study that has those materials on it. And this is the farm safety. And as we started out the course, we reread actually the chapter that's in your agroecology book. And this really helped us start out with our making sure that we're looking at ecological livestock production and what it's based on. So we do, of course, you know, have a number of issues that concern us in industrial scale livestock production, but we also focus on how we do ecological livestock with the capture of solar energy, and we do that with forages, with grass. We also look closely at nutrient cycling, and these slides here on the carbon cycle actually give us even a, a closer idea of how we cycle nutrients and animal production can actually be carbon neutral depending on how animals animals are raised but the methane from ruminant production is is always a concern but keep in mind that animals are ecological uh, grazing animals and grasslands evolve together and really you need animal impact, you need grazing impact to take care of these grasslands. And they're so important because they store, they sequester a lot of carbon from the atmosphere and they store it. And actually in some places, animals are the only way to raise food crops and pastoralists all around the world raise animals in some of the harshest environments on earth. So. We also looked at, uh, or we're looking throughout the semester at how animals add biodiversity. We're very concerned about animal welfare. And then we will be looking more at societal issues and the imbalance of power in our food systems and particularly in the integration in the structure of meat companies. So we'll be looking at this closely. And again, we look at specific issues at the, the SD farm. So keep in mind that what ecological livestock is based on are the same principles that we studied in agroecology with crops, that it's based on effective capture of solar energy, nutrient cycling, biodiversity, and then we strive to make it drug free. And we can often do that with a high level of biodiversity and then the importance of equity for animals or animal welfare. So these are the issues that we started out with 
and we went straight to foraging, grazing, and you had a, a mini lecture and you also read about using the grazing stick and learned how to make calculations. So we started out focusing on the importance of knowing different types of forages, grasses, legumes, some brassicas, um, and then we looked at different growth types of forages because you do need to be able to recognize some forages. We've actually started working on a few grasses like orchard grass and uh, fescue, recognizing the, the leaves, their growth formation, and recognizing some of the legumes also. It's very important to be able to do year-round grazing if you're depending on forages instead of corn, for example. So this is how we do year-round grazing in the high country, that we know that the cool season grasses do well in the spring and the fall, and that some of these um, warm season grasses are needed during the, the summer slump. So we'll have good production in the summer. And we talked about the importance of different grazing systems that um, continuous does not give the plants, the forage plants, a chance to recover. So that's why we do rotational grazing. And generally here in the high country, we keep our animals off of a pasture for about 30 days so it can regrow. And what we're doing is we're recreating um, in nature how bunched herds move on to, to new pasture. So we talk about forage development, we talk about when it needs to be harvested because yes, as it grows, you're gonna have more dry matter, but the problem is, is that the palatability and the nutrients decline as these forages mature. The lignin and cellulose also increase, so that means actually because there's more cellulose that there's gonna be more methane production. So rotational grazing is also an important way to, to reduce methane. So we looked at um, how you do rotational grazing with your fencing, with designs and water. And then we also talked about how you handle grazing uh, in the dead of winter, that ideally you go ahead and stockpile starting in August. And this leaves basically standing hay in the field that the animals can go harvest and that's strip grazing. But you also do need to, to make some hay or you need to make silage. So we talked about methods of making hay. When you learned how to use a grazing stick, you depended on a fact sheet and that gave you a lot of different formulas and um, told you how the first thing you have to determine when you're deciding how big to make a paddock to put your animals in for a particular amount of time. We typically do four days at the SD farm. When you learned about it from Sarah Flack in Vermont, she was only leaving the animals in for one day. But you have to determine first how much you need, what the cows need, and then you need to determine, okay, what's out in the field. So basically it's two parts of the formula that you need to know of uh, the numerator you need to know the weight of the animals, or it may be that you know the weight of the whole herd, but you need to know the weight of the animals um, and then what um, percent intake they need as a percent of body weight. With animals that are high producing, they're gonna need more. Dairy cattle need up to 5% dry matter as a percent of their body weight. Um, and so you need to know how many days you want to leave them in the paddock to be able to determine your paddock size. That's the numerator and then the denominator in this particular formula. This is to determine how many acres are required. You need to know what's out there. And so you need to know what the yield is. And that's when you use the grazing stick to measure how many inches are out in the pasture. And remember, you're not going to graze all of it. It's not all available because most pastures you don't want to graze it past three inches because you want you don't want just pure stubble you or dirt you really want the roots to be able and the forages to regrow so in the example that um, the Vermont
grazer gave, uh, I think she had nine inches of height in the pasture. She took it down to three inches, so that gave her six inches to work with. And this was actually the formula here that she used that she had uh, 50 cows. So in the numerator, here's the 50 cows. They weighed about a thousand pounds each. And I think they were, um, well, actually they were lactating. Um, they needed 3% of their body weight, dry matter 3%. And then she only left them out in that paddock for one day. And so she divided this whole numerator by um, her denominator of 200 pounds um, per acre per inch of dry matter. And she got that because she was working with um, a cool season grass and she determined that it was, um, I think it was, hers was kind of a, an average stand. And so she determined that she had 200 pounds of dry matter per acre per inch. And she multiplied this by the number of inches she was working with. And she was intending on getting 100% utilization. We don't get that high utilization at the SD farm. Ours is more like 60% or 70% because we don't move the animals every day. So she divided numerator by denominator and she got that she needed 1.25 acres uh, for one day for the herd of 50 animals. So uh, really one of the trickiest things to learn about using the grazing stick is the stand density. And with our grazing stick, I think you saw us lay it into the pasture. We laid it horizontally. And if you only see a little bit of the grazing stick, about zero to four inches, that means you have an excellent stand. And so that's going to take you up into you know, the higher numbers here. Um, at the SD farm, we've had up to 350 pounds per acre per inch. We've had really excellent pasture when we're doing rotational grazing. If you see more of the stick, then you know it's, it's sparse. And so that means that the yield um, is just not going to be as high. So you do need to know how to use the grazing stick. And you will um, need to do calculations. So you'll definitely be tested on that. The next thing that we moved on to was um, understanding more about nutrition and feeds. And we just have studied only a little bit of nutrition so far. Nutrition, we've, um, we've studied more about what types of feeds offer the nutrients needed. We'll study more about nutrition later in the semester, but I did include in your mini lecture some basic things. And so you do need to know the basic classifications of livestock feeds. And this is where we studied about uh, pasture, or we studied about roughages, we studied about hay, we studied about silage, and in any case you always want your pastures to be high quality. Having more legumes is going to actually be a higher quality because they have more protein. And we know that um, the digestibility of the forage is going to decrease as it matures because the lignin and cellulose is increasing and protein and soluble carbohydrates is decreasing as it matures. So we, you know, looked at the difference between straw and hay. You know, hay is very high quality for livestock and, um, and we looked at what ensiling is for silage. So all of these are for pasture or it's for harvesting good quality hay or it's for um, harvesting silage, but some animals need more concentrated sources of feed and for example poultry and, and pigs. And so we needed to look at you know anything that's over about 18 percent protein is going to be a protein instead of an energy feed and you don't want to feed protein for energy, that's an expensive way to feed animals, you feed protein for the amino acids. And there's plant, animal, purified, um, non-protein nitrogen. Uh, the animal is the highest type of animal protein, like fish meal, or like the insect meal that I like to use.
but plant proteins like roasted soybeans, animals, love, and um, many other types of legumes, beans, peas, the oilseed meals are what's left after you remove the fat from the plant protein. Uh, keep in mind that there's many ways of supplying the, the macro minerals like um, calcium and phosphorus. Um, that might be oyster shell, it might be bone meal or rock phosphate. And the book didn't talk as much about how you supply vitamins. They said, oh, just use a vitamin mineral premix. But we actually use pasture to supply a lot of the vitamins. And then there's our other good sources like bran as an example. So y'all did need to be familiar, you know, with basic feeds. And then you also, um, you did have a mini lecture to help you with that. As we moved on, we uh, took a field trip. This was our second field trip. The first field trip, we went out to Shipley's. And it's important to understand, you know, about the Shipley Farm. You can look up the website there, but you probably also just remember a lot of the things that we talked about that they do um, rotational grazing. And then we did weigh animals at the farm. And that's when, you know, Eddie talked to us about specific things. If the animals exit the handling facility, the squeeze chute quickly, that means that they were more stressed. If they exit slowly, then they were not as stressed. So some of these details you, you do need to remember from our field trip. Also, the importance of some of these family businesses in our community. And we talked about Mr. R.G. Shipley, who worked for almost 100 years in the high country as, as an educator. So they do uh, dry aging at their farm. That's one of the, the special things that they do. And their animals are mainly grass fed. So our field trips too, you know, you learned a lot of important information there. Um, I put some resources here that Eddie shared with you. Um, these are resources and resources are just more optional for you. But, you know, you do need to remember some of the things that, that he talked about specifically, particularly with, with goats, sheep and goats. And then we also took a quick look at, at the rabbits. So what y'all were responsible for that week was um, a farm animal species of your choice. So this is an example, a good way to test you on that is be able to write an essay on the species that, that you chose to read about. We moved into uh, animal behavior and handling and you did have a choice of reading um, watching the mini lecture or watching the Temple Grandin uh, video. So you had a choice on that, but you did have to read chapter 13 in the um, textbook. You had to read that on animal behavior. And you had to become familiar with understanding why, why we look at animal behavior because it can really increase welfare of animals if we design our systems so that it fits animal behavior. And, you know, it's important to know some of the major types of behavior. Aggression is one that's um, really helpful to know about um, and why we need good handling systems for slaughter, milking, or transport. Um, animal behavior does depend on temperament. And then in the reading, you learned about the flight zone that animals move away from a handler as the handler approaches their individual flight zone or puts pressure on the herd flight zone. And then we learned some specifics about being able to step in, you know, at about a 45 degree angle and step back out because the way you're handling animals is you are applying some pressure, but then you're releasing it. You don't put pressure on and keep it on because that really starts to agitate the animals. And that's why you put pressure on to make something happen, but you take it back off. And so that's one thing we learned about with the flight zone. And we also learned about um, using behaviors for herding. Animals want to be able to see you. Don't stand in their blind spot. They want to be with other cattle. And they also want to return from where they have been. So that helped us understand the 
bud box concept that um, this we used to use this bud box actually at the SD farm. We had a different corral set up and we would let animals into a sorting area. We would hold four animals at a time because four animals could fit in our 20 foot crowd alley. And we opened up the solid gate and the animals would go into the return box. And because herd animals returned from where they came, they would just turn right back around here and they were trying to go back here. The gate was shut. And so they, this was the only way out right here was down the crowd alley. So that's what lined them up to be able to handle them in our squeeze chute. So we learned some interesting uh, handling concepts, but some of y'all uh, focused more on Temple Grandin's round design, her curved designs. And these are really premium um, because the animal can't see what's ahead of it, but it's returning from where it came. You know, it's, um, it's uh, you're using that same type of principle. And this is an advantage because you can work the animals from outside. You know, with this, the bud box, you have to be inside with the animals. There's more opportunity to get hurt. But um, Temple Grandin built this curved design. It just, it costs more usually to build a curved design. So, but both of these concepts are wonderful for low stress handling. So y'all learned about that and um, you also, some of you, you know, had that option that you studied more about Temple Grandin instead. And then we moved to this last week where, again, you had a choice. The reason why we have choices is, for one thing, just trying to um, help y'all the way you learn best and also realize that ethics are always important. Some people may not agree with raising uh, farm animals for human uses. So we do try to look at options, um, invertebrates like bees and insects. And insects, of course, are very important sources of protein. So you had a choice to either read about cattle or bees or go on a different, uh, go on two different field trips. So again, this is a good way, a good way to test y'all with this would be um, with an essay. But, you know, it is important to know about management of particular animals. And the one that, that we really, um, I'm not able to click on the cattle management right now, um, but the cattle management was an example that you need to know about reproduction, you need to know about um, nutrition, you need to know about genetics. And it's the same case with honeybees. In fact, probably even more complex because bees are so complex. So these were some of the main materials that, you know, we're studying more principles instead of individual species production, although we, we have some of both. Um, we, you also do need to know some of the farm skills that we've been learning at the SD farm. Here's an example of a fencing PowerPoint. This has not yet been assigned. It's just been more learning while we're in the field. Um, but it is, you do need um, to know about fencing that you, when you're using electric fencing, for example, you, you need a ground so it passes through the animal that's standing on the ground. Um, so, you know, if you click on this PowerPoint, there's definitely more information about how to hook a charger up to the fence wire and then also to the ground rod. Uh, again, you need to know um, uh, some of, you need to know um, how to identify forage species such as orchard grass compared to fescue. And that was another thing we looked at when we went with Eddie. He showed us what the um, festolium looks like and he showed us what Kentucky 32 looked like. So we took a closer look at, at those forages. And then you need to have an understanding about how hay is made. We don't have haymaking equipment at the farm right now, but we are trying to get some. We're just looking at how to make hay with a scythe. And obviously you can use tractor drawn equipment for this, but it's hard to keep your um, tractor equipment or your hay equipment working, and it's also very expensive. So we're looking at something in the middle. We're actually looking at a walk behind. 
So these are some of the things that you need to be prepared for and be able to answer with your exam. It's going to be a closed book exam and it'll probably have about 40 short answer questions and about two to three essay type questions.